This game is fucking amazing. Never before would I have thought that such a simple game by what seems to be a first time developer would capture my attention so fully and never let go. Against the Storm has completely roped me in, ladies and gentlemen, and it really makes me pissed that I'm now all old and gross and have to work a day job to help support my incoming baby. Whose idea was it for me to inseminate my wife? Now I have responsibilities and no time for games. Fuck! This is the true plight of man. Too many games, not enough time. And Against the Storm has made me realize this like no other game I've played in the last few months. Maybe Baldur's Gate 3, but that includes Helldivers 2, which I broke my patient gaming code for. Don't tell anyone. Okay, okay, let's slow down. Take her easy. Breathe. Deep breaths, Jarek. Hello everyone, Jarek Defiler the Patient Gamer here with another great pick for today's patient gaming crowd, Against the Storm. Mm. Developed by One Eremite Games and first entering early access in October 2021 with a full release on December 8th of 2023, Against the Storm appears upon first glance to be a simple strategy sim city building game made by some unknown indie studio made up of only six people. But nope, this is not just another city builder my friends. Against the Storm is a treasure trove of depth, innovative mechanics, charming atmospheric tones, and much to my surprise and elation, a roguelite. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Eremite Games managed to make not only a functional and competent roguelike city builder, but a perfectly balanced, immersive, and addicting one at that. This is the epitome of just five more minutes game design. I haven't had this much digital crack since Civ 5. Now, although I put 33 hours into the game, I still feel like I've barely scratched the surface, so this may be more of a first impression than full-on review. Maybe, maybe second impression. Take that as you will. But I was thoroughly impressed by how Against the Storm managed to meld city building mechanics with a roguelite structure. I mean, who would have thought this would work so well? Maybe there's other games out there that do this, I don't know, I haven't heard of any, but they did it so well here, I'm surprised that this is the studio's first game. The way it works is, you play a viceroy to the queen, the game's head honcho. You're all struggling to survive in the world's last inhabitable city, the Smoldering City, your home base, which serves as a stronghold against a seasonal blight storm that wipes out the world's settlements every once in a while. The queen sends you out into the world to forge these temporary settlements and deliver her requested orders that will increase the Smoldering City's supplies. During each settlement mission, you get to pick among two options for each order, and once you fulfill it, you send it to her and get some sort of reward in exchange. This can be things like goods, new blueprints, more settlers, things like that, but the catch is, if you don't fulfill your orders in a timely manner, the queen gets pissy and if her annoyance reaches its peak, you fail the mission and are sent back home. However, there are multiple ways to reduce her frustration in each mission. Pillow forts, massages, puppy videos, okay, no wait. You can actually fulfill orders promptly, which makes her happy, or you can explore the forest around your settlement's border, unlocking what's called glades and completing any of the small objectives that lie within. The more dangerous the glade and the more dangerous the objective, the greater the reward. And this is integral to completing each mission, as along with the queen's frustration meter, you also have a reputation meter that, once filled, completes the mission. That is generally the goal of each settlement. And during each mission, outside of the queen's influence, your main challenge is fighting the elements, which entails the forest hostility towards you, which increases as you knock it down more with your woodworkers, as well as the perpetual rain that takes different phases. Light drizzles are normal, but once it starts storming, it can have devastating effects on your settler's resolve, making them unhappy and leave, or even killing some off depending on that mission's conditional modifiers and forest mysteries. Also, keeping your settler's resolve high is a challenge in and of itself. So that's the basics, but boy is there much more involved than that. Much more. So much more that I don't fully understand it at all yet, because I'm a moron. But that's more my fault than the game's. I was really just enjoying taking my time with this one and just chilling. This is a great low stress game that you can just sit back and relax with and that's probably my favorite feature. Sure you can up the difficulty for more of a challenge, but the game still has a very relaxing atmosphere regardless. Chill brah. The best part is, once you complete a mission, you can choose to continue playing the settlement, missing out on more XP or unlocks, or you can go back to the world map and start the next one. I've continued playing a few missions and it was a blast. It never gets boring, just expanding and building and discovering glaze that's all super fun and engaging. And by the end of it, you have this massive powerful settlement that you can be proud of. I mean, look at all these perks I unlocked. <laughs> but as you progress along, like any roguelike really, you also have meta progression. In the case of Against the Storm, this involves you upgrading various parts of the smoldering city. There's a pretty hefty amount of upgrades here, but mostly they're linear with stat increases that make your going easier as things move along. Although there are a lot that have some very useful bonuses such as granting permanent blueprints, more on that later. Deeds are like achievements you unlock in the game, but they have a direct purpose and reward. Most deeds will give you experience points that allow you to level up and buy better upgrades, while others will grant you decorations you can use in game to upgrade your hearth, which is like your settlement center where everyone gathers around and feeds themselves and whatnot. It's also super important for keeping your houses fueled against the storm, very important for settler resolve. 
You also have a home in the smoldering city where you can go to visit your sexy face-fried aunt who herself was once a viceroy. She gives you some guidance on the story and lore, and as far as I know, she doesn't have any effect on gameplay, but it's nice to have her there nonetheless for those who are interested in getting more information about the game's story anyways. So as you unlock all this meta progression, you find yourself becoming stronger with each mission and tackling each challenge with more and more ease. What I'm saying is, the game's pacing is mere perfection. Like Vanessa Williams' 1998 Got Milk ad perfection. Just look at that forehead, you can park an aircraft carrier on that bad boy. Mm. There was never a time I felt over my head except when I jumped into a veteran difficulty game early on just to try it out. I lost, but even then it didn't feel bad. I felt that I just didn't have enough experience, not that the game was too hard or poorly paced, quite the opposite. I've only lost a few missions thus far as I mainly play in the noob difficulty, but it never annoyed or frustrated me that I lost. At the end of the day, I just didn't really know what I was doing. But now that I have more time with the game, I don't really struggle at all unless I make poor decisions on my build. And how does that work exactly? How does one have a build in a strategy city building roguelite? Well, it all comes down to your choices when picking what's called blueprints. At the start of every match, as well as every time you reach a certain point in your reputation, mainly by fulfilling the Queen's orders, you are granted access to a pool of blueprints. What these are are what buildings you're allowed to build in each given mission. At the start, you get the option to choose one blueprint out of a pool of three with each choice, but you can upgrade your city to allow for more choice in the pool. For instance, I can choose one out of four blueprints each pick, and you will soon discover that it's fairly important on which blueprints you choose and what cornerstones you pick each mission as well. These are basically passive buffs that you get on a mission per mission basis. But it's not necessarily game breaking if you don't choose many that have symmetry. After all, for the first like 15 hours, I had no idea what I was doing and just picked whatever I felt like, and I wasn't losing that many missions. Maybe I'm just that good. Nah, not really. I'm just playing on the noob difficulty like I said before. I'm sure on harder difficulties it might be different. But once you discover how different buildings complement each other, you find yourself unlocking different strategies that allow for things to run like a well-oiled machine. This is where the game begins to open up. Each building will have some purpose, either in what resources it gathers, produces, or influences, but the best part is, even within those buildings, there are more options. Break down. For instance, say you have a bakery and you want to make some pay. You might think that you have to have flour, check, you do, and some kind of fruit. Well, sure, you could do it that way. Or you can use meat, or herbs, or eggs, or even insects, or your mom. You have all these options to make pie instead of being pigeonholed into having to make one specific resource. This is brilliant design because it allows for many things. One, you never feel like you have to build the same thing every single time. There are some buildings where you do, but those are like woodcutting camps and things like that. But two, it allows you to try different builds and still be able to progress. Three, basically no resources ever really goes to waste if you know what you're doing. And four, as a result, the game just never gets old. So if you tend to focus on producing lots of meat, you can still make a variety of different goods with that meat. Sure, you will still need flour if you want to make pie, which many settlers like, but you can also do other stuff like jerky, kebabs, things like that. And those choices aren't just tied to your buildings. You know those glade objectives I touched on earlier? Well, you have to generally provide resources to unlock them, and even those have multiple options. Sometimes you could choose between stone, fossils, or weapons to unlock stuff. Others may be meat, insects, or roots. There's always room for different play styles and builds. I love it. Very rarely will you find yourself not able to produce or unlock something on a mission due to not having the proper resource. And if you do find yourself in that position, it's a good lesson to be more prepared next time. And speaking of glades, you have three different types, normal, dangerous, and forbidden. Normal will have simple things like resource nodes and maybe some crates that you can unlock, while dangerous will have some threat events that have some time consequence if you don't fulfill them within the time limit. While Forbidden are the big dogs, they have multiple events that can be fairly costly to fulfill and devastating if you fail to. However, with each Glade difficulty comes greater rewards. You fulfill a Forbidden Glade's events, and you will find yourself basking in riches, depending on which route you took. Really fun stuff. Now let me go a little bit more into your settlers and how they tie into all this. These are your worker bees. You can't do anything without your settlers, so it's your responsibility to keep them fed and happy, lest they leave. Or simply die. <laughs> As mentioned before, you must keep their resolve high. This is their well-being, basically. The happier they are, the more reputation you will gain passively, with a plateauing effect eventually. You want resolve as high as possible, because in storms and during certain events, they will take a hit to it. So it's always good to have a nice big buffer. In order to achieve this, you have to fulfill each species' needs. This can range from type of food, living conditions, preferred work environment, clothing, and special needs like luxury, leisure, and religion, among others. At the start of each mission, this can be tough, but once you get your build figured out and get a bit more experience, you can get a handle on it pretty quick. 
There's also trading in the game. As you progress, you can begin to unlock trade routes where you can sell specific goods during each mission. As far as I know and as far as I've played, these trade routes only grant you gold when you sell stuff, so I don't know if maybe in the future you can unlock the ability to buy items that you might need. No idea. But if you build a trading post in your settlement, you also get a visit from a trader every 10 or 12 minutes or so. These traders allow for you to purchase some much needed resources that you can't otherwise produce yourself. They often will sell you blueprints and settlement upgrades as well. These you can only use on that given mission, however. It's a nice mechanic to help prevent you from getting stuck in a rut because the blueprint RNG pool shafted you and you can't get that farm you've been needing for the past 20 minutes. <sighs> glory, glory, hallelujah. One thing that you may have noticed about this review so far is that I have not mentioned combat, because there is none, as far as I know. The antagonist is the environment and the ticking clock of the queen's impatience, and generally this is all within your control when you begin to understand the game's mechanics. So yeah, really interesting. There are still a ton of mechanics that I've yet to unlock or dabble in that I can't comment on here. Things like these ancient seals in the world map, rain punk where you use rainwater to enhance your buildings, blight rot and corruption that I never really had to deal with yet that are supposed to harm your production as they spread. You can also control your settlers' consumption, which I never do. There's a lot to the game that I still have yet to experience, and after 33 hours, that's pretty fucking awesome. And I feel confident that I'll do fine, because the game has an excellent knack for giving information to the player. For starters, there is a very nice integrated encyclopedia that covers just about everything in the game. But even while on mission, the UI is immaculate. Everywhere you click, there is information given to the player. You can see how many buildings of a certain type you have made, preventing confusion. You can see what needs your settlers are lacking just by a single click. You can see what resources each building produces by clicking on the resource. You can check your recipes each mission to see what you can actually produce. It's so intuitive and streamlined, I can go on gushing about it for hours. And then there's the aesthetic. The game oozes chill and charm. It's just an immensely relaxing experience, even if you're running against the clock on the Queen's orders. Clicking on a settler will give off this unique response. The graphical style is quaint and charming, reminiscent of Warcraft 1, 2, and 3 back in the day. And the music. Oh god, the music. This shit went on my phone instantly, and I listen to it in my car regularly. Some of the most relaxing music out there. And they tie it nicely with the game's mechanics. For instance, the music is very chill and soothing for the most part. But when the storm hits, you get this slightly haunting what sounds like harp piece that transitions into a bit darker melody that implies some bit of urgencies. Just listen to this. It's seamlessly done and just an absolute immersive pleasure ride. And when the storm ends, you get a nice melody that ushers in a nice feeling of peace and serenity, like such. Truly phenomenal work here when it comes to the music and sound design. I'm thoroughly impressed. Mm, yes. Actually, that's a good place to end it here. Against the Storm, ladies and gentlemen, probably the most perfect game I've played for quite some time. Virtually flawless. I can't really find a negative thing about it. It never gets old, it never gets boring, and it always relaxes me. It's rare that I find a game that doesn't annoy me when I lose. Against the Storm is one of those games, along with Kinchi. All hail Kinchi. But yeah, Against the Storm, ladies and gents, $30 for this masterpiece is an absolute steal. I could see myself getting several hundred hours out of this, no problem. Highly recommend you give it a go. And like all my reviews and first impression videos, here is a taste of the game's soundtrack. Composed by one Mikolaj Kerpios, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that perfectly. This is a track called White Fog, yeah. Enjoy, break down. This has been Jarek Defiler, Viceroy of the Ages. You all have a good morning, afternoon, evening, or night depending on where you are. And embrace the storm, wah.